Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are pleased to have you join us for our Sharing Ocean Acidification Resources for Communicators and Educators, or SOURCE, webinar today. Our series is presented by the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program in collaboration with National Marine Sanctuaries. Our goal is to provide ocean acidification communication tools to formal and informal educators, and stakeholders and rights holders across the country to promote a more integrated and effective ocean acidification education community. My name is Natalie Lord and I'm the Capacity Building and Engagement Canals Fellow at the Ocean Acidification Program. And I'll be facilitating today's session along with Liz Parati, the Education and Outreach Coordinator also at NOAA OAP. During the presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. We are recording this presentation. It will be available on our YouTube channel. We will share the link to that shortly. You are welcome to type questions or comments into the questions control panel. We'll monitor incoming questions and respond to them or pose them to our speakers at the end of the presentation. Our presentation today is a two-part series uh, with researchers from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, Abigail Seasty and Dr. Emily Rivest. Abby Seasty is a PhD candidate at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. She has a BS and an MS in biological sciences from the University of Alabama. Her research focuses on understanding marine invertebrate responses to climate change. Abby's interested in translating climate change science to education and policy. Abby will be sharing information with us on an ocean acidification curriculum with the American lobster. Thank you, Abby. We please also welcome Dr. Emily Rivest, an assistant professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, William & Mary. Her research focuses on understanding how ecologically and economically important species like oysters, clams, and American lobster will respond to climate change. She's an expert in ocean acidification research, conducting experiments in the laboratory to stimulate future water conditions and using oceanographic instruments to characterize the dynamics, coastal environments of her study species. Emily is passionate about participatory science, often collaborating directly with members of the aquaculture industry, educators, and the public. And with that, we will start with Abby you can take it away. Thanks so much. And myself in building our education outreach projects and materials. Both our partner educators, um, members of the Virginia uh, Institute of Marine Sciences Marine Advisory Program, as well as all the amazing communications folks at Virginia Sea Grant and elsewhere. I also want to stop and thank NOAA, particularly the Ocean Acidification Program and Sea Grant programs, which have given us the time, the space, and the resources to really invest not only in our research, but also in improving ocean acidification literacy and outreach products. So if you are on this webinar call, you probably know that ocean acidification literacy is important and building resources to improve OA literacy is a worthwhile goal. The method by which we do that in our laboratory is by building scientist-educator partnerships. And the benefits of these partnerships can differ based on whether you're a scientist like myself or an educator like most of you on this call. So from my perspective, building these partnerships can improve the outcomes of our outreach efforts because we're co-producing these products with the end users, which are often formal and informal educators. It also helps us learn the perspectives of both educators and students really on in the development process. From an educator's perspective, I'd love to hear more in the chat about how you feel building scientist educator partnerships could benefit you. But from the experiences we've had so far, we know that educators want to improve the quantity and the quality of resources for underexplored topics like ocean acidification. And they know the importance of providing students with hands-on experiences as well as career exploration. 
And we feel that these scientist educator partnerships are a really great avenue to achieve these goals. So now that we know why these partnerships are so essential, we want to know how to build them. And that's what we're going to talk about today in the form of two case studies. I'm going to start off by presenting our laboratory-based case study in which we invited high school teachers into the world of American lobster research. And after that, I'll be turning it over to Emily, who's going to be focusing on our field case study, which is about community science opportunities for high school students focusing on the Eastern oyster. Now, I know it's a long time to take an hour out of your afternoon to learn about ocean acidification resources. So if anyone has to leave this call early, I want to make sure that you know the most important lessons that we've learned on this journey. The first is that partnership is really the key to success. Teachers and scientists are both experts in their respective fields. As a scientist, I may be able to identify really exciting new areas of research that I think students should know about, but as a teacher, one might have an idea about the curriculum that currently exists and what gaps exist in students' understanding. These partnerships allow us to combine that expertise and allow us to invest the time and the resources necessary to make really high quality outreach products. And that investment of time and resources is really crucial. The second main lesson I want you to take away from this is that experiential learning, which we know is really important for student success, can take many forms. We focus a lot on providing real world data that can help make lesson plans meaningful for students, especially on topics that can feel a bit more complicated or abstract. Additionally, these sustained partnerships can allow students more opportunities to see themselves as a scientist. So with that, I'm gonna jump into our first case study in the laboratory. A few years ago, our lab was funded to answer a really exciting question, which is how do American lobsters respond to ocean warming and ocean acidification at different stages of development? Really early on in the proposal development process, we knew we also wanted to address another question. How can we bring ocean acidification research into the classroom? A lot of times as scientists, when we think about building an outreach or broader impacts component of our work, it tends to be an afterthought um, or does not get quite as much attention or time. We knew in order to make this part of our project successful, we needed to give it just as much time and attention as the research that we were conducting. So the first step in this process for us was brainstorming opportunities and areas where our research project was exciting and unique and could really pull in that educational component. We identified three main areas where this could be the case. The first is that American lobsters are commercially and culturally important species, and they can be relatively charismatic, which can really pull students in and get them interested. The second is that we were targeting a really diverse area of focus for this research project, covering things like ocean acidification, lobster life history, water chemistry, and more. So we saw an opportunity to really build an outreach product that touched on all of these areas using our project as a framework. And finally, we really benefited from the availability of real world data, both the data we were generating as a part of this experiment, but also data on the Gulf of Maine where these lobsters are found and other data resources that were publicly available that can be accessed by students and teachers. So once we had an idea of what made this project unique and interesting, we knew we had to consult the professionals. And in this case, professionals meant teachers and educators. Here at VIMS, we have a marine advisory program, which is made up of formal and informal educators, such as Lisa and Bethany shown on the left here. The marine advisory program is great because it allows scientists to consult with educators on novel outreach opportunities. And they have a network of teachers and other educators who are interested in this work. So Lisa and Bethany helped us connect with our partner teachers 
Megan and Sarah shown on the right. These were experienced classroom teachers who are really interested in hands-on learning and they were committed to developing new curriculum that was based on our ongoing project. So this is really the initiation of our scientist educator partnership. And in order to give our outreach efforts as much time and attention as our research efforts, we needed to develop a timeline of when we would conduct all of the activities associated with this outreach. Now I'll go into the details of each of these steps uh, as we go on in this case study, uh, but just leave it to say that we are trying to invest as much planning into our outreach efforts as we do our experiment and research. So the first step to actually building these educational materials was to make sure that our research team had some training on how to do education work. So I participated in a great program we have at FIMS called the Virginia Scientist Educator Alliance. This provides formal training for graduate students on how to translate their research into lesson plans that fulfill our local standards of learning. These lesson plans are then pilot tested by classroom teachers before being publicly available for anyone to access. So this was our first foray in creating educational materials as a part of this project. And I formed a lesson plan um, based on lobster development data. The next step and a really interesting and novel part of this exercise was our teacher research internship. We invited Megan and Sarah, our two partner educators, into our laboratory at BIMS, where they stayed for a week and were able to completely engage in our lobster experiment. Our, the teachers helped us collect data, they tested out different techniques, and they participated in really every aspect of the cleaning, data collection, and lobster husbandry. So by observing this project in action, they were able to start brainstorming different areas where they found connections with their goals for their students and started developing some lesson plans based on what they saw and they heard in their week at our campus. So based on those experiences, our partner teachers came up with a really excellent suite of educational materials focused on high school and some middle school classrooms. These lesson plans were developed with the scaffolding in mind so that they could be used individually by teachers who were interested in just one topic or put together as an entire suite of curriculum that focuses on everything from ocean acidification processes to measuring bathymetry to the lobster life cycle. These were really easily accessible using Google Drive and they used pre-existing resources and platforms and leveraged those opportunities to bring all those resources together for interested educators. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about each of those lesson plans, but I'll give a brief overview for you if you're interested. Altogether, seven lesson plans were developed and those with stars indicate lesson plans that use the specific data that we generated during our experiment. The overarching goal of this lesson plan collection is for students to learn about ocean warming and ocean acidification processes and apply those topics to effects on American lobster development. The first three of these lesson plans don't actually use data from our experiment themselves, but they use our lobster experiment as a framework to teach concepts in chemical and physical science including learning how to read uh, bathymetric maps of the Gulf of Maine, learning the causes and consequences of ocean and coastal acidification, and learning how to test water quality and explore the relationship between water quality and biology. The second suite of these lesson plans focus more specifically on our lobster experiment and use that data to explore different topics in biology including identifying different stages of the lobster life cycle, learning how controlled experiments are designed and how hypotheses are created, analyzing the effects of ocean warming and acidification on lobster respiration, and measuring and analyzing eye index as a metric of lobster embryo development. 
So together, these lesson plans have a really excellent um, theme of ocean acidification, but touch on a lot of different concepts. But they can each be used individually by teachers who might just be interested in one of those topics. But it was important to us that the framing of this lobster experiment was not just you know, a one-off thing, but it had the opportunity to give students what feels like a hands-on research experience and to have them invested in life as a scientist. So to that end, we recruited the communications team at Virginia Sea Grant, who produced photo, video, and written content around this experiment and the teacher research internship. They compiled all of these materials into a story map, which has been published publicly and anyone can access it, but it also provides access to each of these lesson plans um, in a format that we think is really useful for teachers uh, who want to teach more about ocean acidification, as well as life as a scientist in general. And I'll show you just a quick preview of that lesson plan on the screen here. So as you can see, there's a lot of different videos that students can watch showing what it's like to work on this experiment in the laboratory and to see lobsters in action, as well as easy links to get to those various lesson plans. So finally, it was very important to us that rather than having these lesson plans just disappear into the internet, that we were very uh, thoughtful about how we distributed these materials to teachers we thought could benefit from them. So we hosted a teacher workshop on site where we invited regional science teachers to VIMS and introduced them to both the educator and research teams. And we demonstrated many of the lesson plans that were developed and also included different hands-on experiences. As you can see here, we have some teachers looking through microscopes to observe different lobsters at stages of development. So we could really get them interested and engaged. And so these teachers could pass on the interesting hands-on experiences that they received to their excitement when teaching their students about ocean acidification. So if you are interested in accessing, accessing any of the educational products that I talked about today, I've included some QR codes on the screen here, which I think will also be available in the chat. Uh, we have links to our story map, the teacher generated lesson plans, as well as all of the lesson plans that have been produced as a part of the Virginia Scientist Educator Alliance program. So I wanna highlight a couple of the key lessons that I think are unique to this case study and have really benefited us in future work with scientist educator partnerships. The first is the importance of leveraging existing resources and networking networks to maximize our team's effort. So we took advantage of the expertise available at our institution, as well as the teacher networks that our educators already had to make sure we were building the most comprehensive materials possible and that they would actually get used in classrooms. The second is that we thought it was so important to provide our partner educators with the time and the resources to build products that they actually want to use. Now to do that right away in the proposal process for this project, we included in the budget money to house and feed and provide a stipend for our partner educators. This allowed them time in the summer to commit to working on this curriculum without distractions and without worrying about the financial impact. So that is really key to building these long-term partnerships. So I wanna take a minute um, to pull the audience again uh, about specifically teacher research internships. So I'm gonna launch that poll now. I think it is launched, lovely. Um, and if you could take a minute just to answer that poll, we'll share the results in a minute. And with that, I'll also turn it over to Emily to start um, her portion of the presentation.
All right. Great. Thank you, Abby. And welcome, everyone. I will be talking next about our second case study uh, in the field. So as uh, an ocean acidification scientist, one of the challenges of studying ocean acidification in the coastal environment, whether it's in the coastal Gulf of Maine, where juvenile lobsters are recruiting, or whether it's in the Chesapeake Bay, where we have Eastern oysters, is that this global process of acidification is occurring across a mosaic of conditions. Um, and that challenges us to understand what the effect of acidification might be for, for animals like lobsters and oysters. On the map here on the left of your screen, you can see a projection of what bottom pH is um, yesterday or was yesterday. It was a forecast at that time. Uh, the different colors represent the different pH levels. And you can see that the colors aren't the same throughout this map. So the pH environment, the chemical environment that oysters are experiencing across their habitat is different depending on where you are. Uh, the purple triangle for reference is where events is located. So uh, pH can vary across, spatially across oyster habitat. From this time series on the right, you can see that pH is very dynamic throughout time. This is a time series of the month of June from last year collected near VIMS. And for your reference, I've put on this map um, in purplish pink, the uh, average open ocean pH we have today and the projection in red of that 0.3 decrease uh, in pH that we expect to happen in the open ocean by the year 2100. But you can see, um, regardless of the, so the size of this change, that what oysters are experiencing temporally in their environment goes well beyond what we expect to see on average in the open ocean by the end of the century. And so these coastal environments where many of us work and many of us live, uh, are these really unique places where we there's so much more we need to know about um, ocean acidification and its effects. And that brings up this very important question then of how can we best monitor acidification and its impacts across this diverse seascape. So that was the motivation for the project that I will talk about next to expand our footprint of understanding through this community science program for looking at the relationship between ocean acidification and oyster ecology. And we call it CSI Oyster for Community Science Initiative Oyster. And this is um, in its current iteration is a partnership with a couple of scientists at Washington College in Maryland. And in Virginia and in Maryland, we each have a partner teacher that we work with. Uh, Sarah Beam in, at the Chesapeake Bay Governor's School in Virginia, and Emily Beck and Melsker Kanich at the Gunston School in Maryland. And on this map here, you can see uh, in green the sites where we are collecting data uh, for this project uh, currently. The sites in black are our historical sites that we've used in the past, but where we're not currently collecting data. This project engages about 100 high school students each year, students that work with these two teachers, multiple undergraduate students from um, our two institutions um, and other local institutions, graduate students uh, who work with me, like Abby, and um, many summer students and volunteers. And this project has been going on since 2017. Uh, when I uh, was a new faculty member at VIMS. So we're currently in year six of, of collecting the kind of data that I'm going to be sharing with you and uh, working with teachers in these areas. <clears throat> so to understand the relationship between uh, oyster survival and growth and water conditions, including the chemistry of the water, 
these teachers and their students have established sites near their school that they visit every two to four weeks. And at each site, they have deployed a crate of oysters. And when they visit the site, they'll measure water quality using a handheld YSI instrument, like shown here in the picture on the left, to look at things like temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And then we've trained them how to collect and poison following international best practices, bottle samples of water that are then brought back to VIMS where we measure the pH and total alkalinity of the water. For the oysters that are deployed at each site, the students keep track of the survival of the oysters through time. And they also measure the size of the oysters each time they visit the site using uh, calipers, similar to the way we would do it at VIMS. Um, as well as using this handy dandy photo bucket <laughs> so they can take a picture of each oyster. And um, then using the image, we can engage other students who may not be able to actively go to the field to help us collect data about how oyster size is different between the sites or how it changes through time. And being able to, to see the oysters either through the images or in person is really impactful because the students can see through their own eyes, not just through numerical data, how the oysters are changing through time and that oysters at one site might look different from oysters at another site. So through this project, uh, I just wanted to, sh to give you the briefest snapshot of the kind of uh, information that we're learning from this project um, here in the figure on the on the right is showing the growth of the oysters over the course of a year so their their size at the end of the year and you can see that oysters in Virginia in general grew more than oysters in Maryland did and that pattern in growth was related to patterns in salinity and the pH of the water and in the calcification conditions that were unique to the sites in Virginia um, compared to the sites in Maryland. <clears throat> so as we've progressed through this project, we've been able to engage students um, through these teachers directly and participating in the science. But this challenge kept coming up of, well, this, this is such a wonderful project. How can we share this with other teachers, more students? Basically, how can we provide remote access to this kind of community science? And so through the current iteration of this project, which is funded through NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, we wanted to deepen the student understanding of the scientific process, provide additional and different kinds of opportunities to participate in real data collection in the NAP and analysis and to advance environmental, lit environmental literacy related to ocean acidification. And so our process for doing this was to first uh, engage the two teacher partners that we were already working with who are collecting data with their students on curriculum development. So we worked with these teachers to develop curriculum units. Uh, those Two teachers tested those lesson plans in their classrooms. And then we also uh, presented these draft lesson plans to uh, the National Estuarine Research Reserve Summer Teacher Institute. So we got feedback from that cohort of teachers. And currently in this semester, uh, we have eight teachers who uh, we've recruited to use the lesson plans in their classrooms. We provided them with training for content support, and they are conducting pre and post surveys with their students so we can get additional feedback on the curriculum units. Then we will revise the curriculum units and make them publicly available, including to you. So we're not quite at the same stage as with the lobster project. We don't have uh, QR codes or have them posted online yet. But uh, if you would like to send me your contact information, I'll have a slide to remind you later. We'd certainly be happy to send these to you directly once they're available. So we have produced a collection of curriculum units under the title of Why Study Oysters? Understanding Ocean Acidification in the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Using CSI Oyster Citizen Science Strategies. 
and you'll see you'll have already heard me <laughs> oscillate between saying community science and citizen science those are both kind of jargony terms but my definition is that this is science that anyone regardless of their citizenship could engage with so for this curriculum overview um, these curriculum units were collaboratively designed and tested as i mentioned so our design team included the scientists at these two institutions our curriculum um, and curriculum designers and our high school teacher partners the curriculum units are designed to be modular and flexible such that each unit could be used independently depending on how much time the teacher wants to spend on this topic or how the teacher wants to integrate this unit with other units uh, or activities that they have planned for a particular class. Um, the units can also be paired, so they're designed to build on each other, be complementary to each other. And each unit has options for differentiation so that uh, they might appeal to a wider diversity of classrooms. So for example, there's a long or a short mode to a unit or depending on um, what, what the local environment is that the school is in, there's, there could be a field trip option or have students bring things in instead, um, as I'll talk about in a minute. And all of these uh, units are focused on citizen science in the sense that they share the value of community-engaged scientific research. They use data collected by students through the CSI Oyster project. So hopefully the students in the classes get even more excited that, you know, these data are not just generated um, historically or just for the purpose of this exercise, that these were their peers that were in the field collecting these exact data that now they're working with in the classroom to see you know, what they can discover about, uh, from these data. And the units also share additional resources for further exploration. So unit one is focused on data analysis interpretation. This unit specifically incorporates the data generated by the CSI Oyster project. Its guiding questions are how do local water chemistry conditions affect oysters and where are oysters most vulnerable to OA and water quality stressors and why. We designed a short and long mode of this unit based on what the sort of data handling or analytical skills that class already has. So in general, students work in small groups to analyze water quality and oyster data, either working with the, the raw data themselves or with figures that were already generated from the CSO Oyster project. They can calculate summary statistics, plot results, and draw inferences about the relationship between OA water quality and oyster growth. And then the class comes together and compares the results among the CSI Oyster sites. Together, they would interpret patterns and discern what water quality parameters oysters need to survive and grow. The second unit is about water quality testing. And I uh, also really like this unit because there's a field trip option, but there's also a bring your own water option where the, the students can collect water from their local environment uh, things that are places that are important to them, maybe, or even a puddle um, in their yard. So the guiding questions here are what do animals need to survive and thrive in their environment? How does water in our local area compare to the Chesapeake Bay data that we analyze? So, you know, potentially building off that first unit. How do water conditions affect what can live in the water? And how are humans affecting water conditions? So either in the field or in the classroom, students would test their water sources for salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen using this salt water test kit, which we have provided the teachers who are testing these lesson plans for us. And then they determine whether oysters could live in those water sources. They can relate their local waters to what they learned about Chesapeake Bay, and they discuss the environmental tolerances of different organisms. So maybe oysters can't live there, but other kinds of organisms could live there. Unit three ties all of these together a little bit in the context of why I talk about oysters, the importance, the importance of science communication. 
So in this unit, students ultimately create a science communication product, either a podcast or social media campaign or a public presentation. And they build up to that by looking at a range of examples of science communication and planning their product in, by thinking about the situation of the story, the type of story they want to tell, what their target audience will be, and the goals and objectives of that communication product. So if you are interested in accessing these educational products, please send me an email and I will uh, make sure to send you a copy of these directly once we have the final versions of these curriculum units. We should have the final versions by the end of August, so if you're planning what you'll be teaching in the fall, uh, please consider using one or more of these units. For this second case study, some of those specific lessons learned, which Abby uh, already mentioned in the beginning, is that experiential learning can take many forms. We incorporated real world data that students collected, high school students collected, uh, in our lesson plans. And we hope that we will see from the surveys, we hope that it will make these lessons feel more meaningful for their peers in the classroom. The opportunity to develop these curriculum units really came about because of the sustained partnership we've had over the past six years with these teacher partners that as we've gone along, they, they have seen the success um, in their own students and are thinking about how they can incorporate it even more in their classrooms and how we can share that with other teachers. And in that way, you know, these teachers have had hands-on education themselves, and that has translated to enhanced student engagement. So going back to our, to our overall lessons learned, I hope you uh, have, have clearly seen these takeaways that partnership is really the key to success. And for both of these projects, when we think about partnership, we've thought about it from the idea generation stage. Uh, for this, this whole process um, in the sense that if, if scientists want to extend their work into classrooms, they really need to tap into the expertise that teachers have because teachers know what curriculum content and support exist and they know what they need. <laughs> so through this partnership, scientists can provide, help provide opportunities to fill those gaps and meet those needs. For both sides of the partnership, it takes time and investment, and so that should be supported through the funding in the grant budget, and so it's necessary that this kind of design and planning work happens at the proposal stage. The other uh, lesson learned that came out of this is related to accessibility in marine science, and for both of these projects, these projects both have overlapped with the pandemic, and so we were really confronted full in the face with accessibility for all aspects of the work involved. But um, it, it allowed us to think um, thoughtfully and carefully about how we can make everything we're doing more accessible, especially to people who cannot participate in person. Um, in the case of CSI Oyster, people who don't have access to a shoreline site and so there'd be no way for them to practically help collect data. How can we still engage them with this wonderful project? So our future efforts, things we're looking into for uh, future funding opportunities is incorporating virtual reality experiences so that students could uh, be even more immersed in the experience of what data of what collecting the primary data are like. And another way that we can make the research process more visible and engaging is to partner with digital communication specialists to create that interactive online content that Abby showed you uh, to provide a more dynamic context for the lesson plans, for example. So another poll for you all, now that you've heard a little bit more about the process of how these teacher ed educator partnerships have worked with us through these two case studies, if you were to engage in such partnership, 
at what stage would you want to be involved in the project process? The stages that we're thinking of include this brainstorm idea generation phase that happens during proposal development, uh, feedback phase, product development phase, and product use phase. We still have active voting, so we'll keep the poll open for just a few more minutes. Great, thank you. And then one more poll. Could you see yourself using the OA materials that we shared today in your work? Wonderful. That's so exciting. <laughs> Great. And if, and if you answer no, please feel free to put in the chat or questions under um, send to panelists. Um, any barriers that you maybe heard about during um, this presentation? Yes, certainly. We're always looking to improve what we do. So happy to to learn from you and your experience. So uh, it looked like and I you know, had a brief chance to look at the, these uh, poll results, but that um, some of you are interested in pursuing or maintaining scientist educator partnerships, or even maybe starting one if you haven't participated in it before. And so we wanted to share some advice that we, um, that we have found to be useful from our experience. So for scientists, as Abby mentioned, Leveraging the expertise at your institution that already exists is wonderful. <laughs> Nobody wants to recreate the wheel. And we had wonderful uh, education specialists and communicators to work with. So learn about what's already going on at your institution. Involve educators early in the progress or early in the process to make sure that your products are really going to serve the end, end user community. Consider educational partners in the proposal, including the budget, so that everyone is rewarded appropriately for their time and investment, and leverage existing networks to disseminate your products. For educators, consider your student gaps in understanding and the resources that could help, and you probably already know these <laughs> from your classroom experience. Uh, reach out to the outreach departments at local universities. Uh, there may already be programming that you partner with, um, or I would say even reach out to uh, scientists themselves if you're curious about the kind of work that they do. Access databases with OA materials and invite scientists into your classroom. And some of these are ways where you can meet someone and start that relationship. And then over time, there may be opportunities to strengthen that partnership in various ways based on the funding opportunities that we come across as scientists. So with that, I would like to thank you all so much for attending today. And we're really looking forward to your questions and some discussion that we have time for. 
Our contact information is here. Feel free to reach out to us directly if um, you plan to use these materials and you'd like us to uh, make a guest appearance in your classroom, uh, even virtually, or just to connect with us um, in other ways. So thank you again so much and we'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you to both Emily and Abby. Um, if you guys could both come on to the screen so we can see you, we'll go through some of the questions and comments that we see in the question panel here. Um, first of all, I'm seeing that um, your comments about um, training being, uh, supporting teachers and training is totally relevant and that local literacy should be a, a priority. Um, from some of the, the panelists. Um, there were several comments on where they could find the materials. Again, you can find those links in the chat and also on this screen here if you use the QR codes as well. These uh, links, um, should you want to refer to this webinar again, um, will be included as part of the YouTube channel post with this recording as well, which will be closed captioned. Um, I do see a question here. Um, it says, uh, are there many funding opportunities for scientists to pair up with educators? Do the scientists typically need to apply for these? Um, this person is coming from Florida, if that helps with context. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I'm not located in Florida, so I don't know at the state level what specific opportunities might exist there. But uh, from my experience, I can share that for many of the federal funding opportunities that research scientists apply for, there's usually some kind of outreach education component that's expected by the funding agency. And the scientists have a lot of flexibility as to what they propose. And so the funding opportunity doesn't necessarily need to be specifically targeting scientist educator partnerships for scientists to incorporate that kind of activity into their um, project. In that, in in this case, for the for the lobster project, that the lobster project is an example of that case, where the federal funding opportunity was for, uh, you know, lobster research, but there is some outreach broader impacts component and so we chose to create this as the broader impacts component uh, in the case of the csi oyster project that is funded through the ocean acidification programs education mini grant so in that case it was a targeted opportunity uh, to create uh, something related to ocean acidification and education, we didn't necessarily have to create a teacher partnership to do that, but that was the that was what we decided to pursue. So um, there are d many different kinds of opportunities and it doesn't have to be targeted. And I'll just add um, uh, uh, on behalf of NOAA, the ocean acidification program, as you mentioned, um, does have these education mini grants. Uh, but there are other opportunities, most likely through your state's Sea Grant, that may have opportunities opportunities as well to support education and outreach that compare scientists and educators, um, as well as training opportunities as well. And then the National Science Foundation also has um, some grants targeted specifically at diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and also some education and broader impacts as well. So look for those opportunities. Thank you, Emily. Um, we have another question here. Um, is there any interest to relate your work uh, to aquaculture? Yeah, Maybe definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, aquaculture might not be directly as relevant for our lobster research, um, but we definitely work regularly with the aquaculture industry here in Virginia as it relates to eastern oysters um, and i think that you know while that might not be an active component of the lesson plans that emily talked about right now it's definitely an opportunity that we hope to pursue in the future um, we 
you know, engage in research related work that's really applied and focused on um, assisting the aquaculture industry to be more resilient to climate change and ocean acidification. And I think any opportunity to make that more visible to the public and more visible in an education component would be super exciting. If you have an exciting idea and you want to partner up on that, again, you can feel free to reach out to us or whoever would be the most, uh, whoever would make the more, most sense for your, you know, geographic location or what you're interested in, but uh, it's definitely something that we're interested in. And that, uh, uh, go ahead, Emily. Yes. The CSI Oyster format is very translatable to different contexts. So we have used it to partner with oyster gardeners in our area uh, through a student fellowship activity. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, oyster gardeners uh, in our area are members of the community who grow oysters for personal use uh, on their property uh, or you know, in the, in the bay adjacent to their property. And uh, so they, we taught them how to collect similar kinds of data <laughs> about the oysters that they were growing. And um, we are continuing the CSI Oyster Project uh, through additional funding um, this coming year. And we are working on some new sites that would um, either be with permission on, on someone's lease or adjacent to someone's lease so that we can collect information that might be useful to in the more useful in the context of aquaculture. Uh, so, so we're we're trying to see how this program could could be um, used in that context more directly. But certainly, a lot of the other research that we do is either um, directly related to aquaculture or or certainly translatable. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here, um, and it kind of relates to what Abby had just said as well. Um, is there opportunities to pair with international scientists or educators? And um, I believe that Abby offered that if you feel like your project is compatible with their work, feel free to reach out. You can see their emails on the screen, um, or you can contact uh, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program that can help facilitate some of those partnerships as well. We'll put that email address in the chat. Um, uh, one question here, do you have more specific information on the student center data collection program, the CSI o Oyster? My school is on a bay in New York where oysters are raised and I'd be interested in starting one locally. Um, did you uh, work with students just during the school year or over the summer? Was it multi-year? Can you, can you provide a little more details on that program in general? Sure, and I'd be happy to meet with you um, after this concludes, um, if you would like to reach out to me via email. Uh, the way that it works with the current teachers that we partner with is that they collect data with their students during the school year, and then during the summer we don't collect data um, because the teachers are off and doing other, you know, resting, and that's very important too. Um, and for the particular teachers we have, that works best for them. So we provide them with young of the year oysters um, over at the end of the summer. And then those they collect data at the sites with their oysters throughout the school year. And then end of May, early June, we conclude data collection for that year. And those oysters are um, planted on local restoration reefs. Um, so certainly I think it would be very compatible with New York. I'd ha be happy to to share all the all the protocols, the the um, the procedures for for um, what we do with you, and uh, I think in you know in that sense one of the one of the more expensive sides of it is the water quality analysis, the 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 water chemistry analysis that we do. Uh, so if that's something that you wanted to to pursue, you might need some additional funding for that or and or find a local partner at a university who does those kinds of analyses. Um, but certainly um, working with the oysters is is uh, very easy. So that's great. 
Um, great. And there's a question kind of related to this. Um, how might these curricula be used outside the region? Do you have any recommendations or caveats for educators um, using them from another region? And I think that question is for you, Abby. Yeah, so I actually had the opportunity a few months ago uh, to Skype with a classroom in California who is using one of our lobster lesson plans. And one of the changes that they made uh, was introducing a bit of a comparative element to talk about spiny lobsters. So even though you might not have lobsters in your geographic area, maybe you have another crustacean, um, maybe another lobster species that might be more applicable to your students. And introducing that as a comparison, it could be as simple as adding a slide on a PowerPoint that shows the differences between um, the organism that your students might be familiar with and the one that our lesson plan discusses could be a really neat way to get students interested in this project. Um, the other thing is that, you know, while not everyone has eaten lobster, it's generally known as something that's, you know, enjoyable to eat, and that might be another touch point for students. Um, but again, you know, I Skyped to this classroom to talk a little bit about lobsters and our research, and I think utilizing, you know, scientists' time who are interested in this work, who are putting together these materials, is a really good way for it to feel more personal for the students. Um, and especially the video components of our um, story map that put these lesson plans together um, are a great way for students to feel a little bit more in on the action, even if they can't actually be in person. Great, thank you. And then we have one final question here. Uh, uh, have you considered creating something similar with uh, sea urchins? And I'll just mention before our panelists answer um, that we did have a project supported that has had, been featured in another source webinar. I'll put the link in the chat called Virtual Urchin. Um, which is an online curriculum that you can use with your students and it's available in five languages. So Abby um, or Emily, are you, have, yeah. you, have you considered urchins? No, I haven't um, considered urchins because we currently don't have any research projects uh, focused on sea urchins but I do love them <laughs> and think they're equally charismatic and worth teaching about. Um, so I'm really glad to hear that you'll be hearing about some urchin curriculum units very soon. Um, no, yeah, we, we haven't considered that yet, but certainly urchins are also affected by ocean acidification and also important ecologically and economically, especially uh, in the US at least in California. And so, um, so they're certainly worth talking about in this context. Well, thank you to our two speakers. I'll now turn it over to Natalie to wrap us up with last comments. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending the webinar this afternoon or this morning. Um, we welcome any feedback, comments, and suggestions that you may have. If you know of a speaker that might be a great fit for this webinar series, we would love to hear from you. Um, I've shared the email in our chat. Um, you can reach us at noaa.oceanacidification at noaa.gov. We will be holding this webinar series every second Wednesday of the month at 1 p.m. EST. Our speaker for next month is Willow Hetrick. She'll be speaking on June 14th about a uh, community science water quality monitoring program with native Alaskans and other stakeholders in Southeast Alaska. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much again for attending. Have a great rest of your day. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>